Well, thank you for joining us for the Bay Area Older Adults and Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District's Lunch and Learn at Pogus Ridge Open Space Preserve. My name is Dr. Ann Ferguson, and I'm Executive Director of Bay Area Older Adults, which I will call BAO for short. BAO is a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well-being of 42,000 adults age 50 plus each year. We trek on nature trails, learn about different cultures, explore historic sites, experience new culinary flavors, and help connect you to people with shared interests. Since 2013, we've taken more than 4,600 seniors who've walked almost 14,000 miles in more than 30 parks. Photos from some of our walks are shown here along with our website address. The preserve we are exploring today is Pogus Ridge Preserve, which is one of the preserves protected by our partner, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, which I will call MidPen for short. I would like to introduce you to Christine Lobergott, one of the public affairs specialists at MidPen, who will tell you about their agency. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Anne, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. My name again is Christine Lopergat. I'm a public affairs specialist at MidPen Regional Open Space District. We are excited to partner with Bay Area Older Adults on this series of virtual events. And before we get started, I'd like to share the MidPen story. MidPen's mission is to acquire, protect, and restore the natural environment and provide opportunities for public enjoyment and education. In 2004, MidPen expanded its boundaries into coastal San Mateo County, and our mission on the coast side includes preservation of viable agricultural land. Um, MidPen is a public agency created in 1972 by a grassroots voter initiative. We manage 26 open space preserves in Santa Clara, San Mateo, and Santa Cruz counties with nearly 65,000 acres of open space land and over 240 miles of wonderful trails for biking, hiking, dog walking, and equestrian use. Midpen has uh, 25 preserves that are open to the public all year long. This is a map of Midpen's open space lands with each of the dark green areas indicating a Midpen preserve. Midpen's boundary extends from San Carlos to Los Gatos and to the Pacific Ocean, and also from south of Pacifica to the Santa Cruz County line. You can learn more about us and the Open Space Preserves on our website at openspace.org. And now I'll turn it back to Anne for the presentation. So our first question is, have you ever been to Polgus Ridge Preserve? Okay, so it looks like most people have not been to this preserve. That's great. So you'll get to see a little bit before you go. So for those of you who haven't been to the preserve before or who've not been recently, the preserve is located in Redwood City and it's off of Highway 280 between California 92 and California 84. You can take either Highway 280 or 101 to get to the preserve. To get to the parking lot from Highway 280, you'd take the Edgewood Road exit east and make a left at Crestview Drive, make your first left onto Edmonds Road, and then bear left when the road forks to stay on Edmonds Road. Just down the road, you'll see a parking lot for about 20 cars. There is no specific street address. The park is basically across the street from Edgewood Park and there's a restroom in the parking lot. So today we will travel on four different trails at Pogus Ridge Preserve, 
which is a 366 acre preserve that has one half a mile flat leisurely trail and the rest of the trails have moderate hills. There are ridge views and a combination of shady and sunny trails. One of the special features is a 17.5 acre area in the center of the preserves where dogs can be off leash. Bicycles and equestrians are not allowed in this preserve. The reason why we are visiting today is because it's springtime and this preserve is known for its showy spring flowers, such as warrior plume, milkmaids, fetid adder's tongue, giant trillium, and more. It is also home to 90 native species of trees, shrubs, ferns, and flowers. The spring is a great season for finding and learning about wildflowers. During this presentation, I'm going to give you some tips and resources that will help you identify wildflowers you find in parks and preserves this spring. Let's start with some basics about flower structure and function. The four main parts of a flower are the sepals, the petals, and the flowering part of the plant, which for most flowers contains both male and female reproductive organs. Petals are generally bright colored and attract pollinators, which allow the flowers to reproduce, and the sepal is a structure that protects the flower when it is just a bud. The male reproductive organ is called a stamen and contains the anther that produces pollen and the filament that supports the anther and makes it accessible to the pollinators like bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. The female reproductive organ is called a pistil and contains the stigma that is the sticky tip that catches pollen, a style that positions the stigma so it can catch the pollen, and the ovary that contains the female reproductive cells called ovules, which after pollination develop into seeds. The ovary itself develops into the fruit. So let's see these wildflower parts on real flowers, not just a diagram. One last point I want to make about the reproductive parts of a flower is that the ovary may be located below or above the sepal and petals, as shown in these two diagrams and photos. This is a photo of milkmaids. You can see the stamen, which has the yellow anther on the tips of the green filaments that positions the anther high enough for the pollinators to easily reach it. You can also see a bud that has a sepal protecting it. You can see the pistil that is in the center with the white tip. Last but not least, you can see this flower has four distinct symmetrical petals with veins running through them. Most wildflowers are hermaphrodites, which means they have both a pistil and stamen on the same flower. In contrast, monoecious plants have both female and male flowers on the same plant, just not on the same flower. Examples include sunflowers and manroot. There are some plants that are dioecious, which means the plant has only female or male flowers. Examples include hollies and coyote brush. Hermaphrodite flowers and monoecious plants have the advantage of not depending on pollinators to reproduce. The disadvantage is if they only self-pollinate, it lowers the species' genetic diversity and lowers the plant's ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions.
This coyote brush is dioecious and has separate male and female plants. You can see the flowers look a lot different. The man root is monoecious and you can see the male and female flowers are on the same plant. The female flower has a clearly visible ovary below its petals. To make sure we're all on the same page, let's have a quiz question. Which of the choices below is a flower part that plays a role in reproduction? So everyone is right, the answer is stigma. This is the part of the pistil that is responsible for catching pollen. When you go out for a wildflower walk, I recommend bringing three things to help you identify the flowers. First, a ruler or something similar that will allow you to measure the size of the flower and the height of the plant. Second, bring a notepad and pen to write down where you found the flower and the time of year. Third, you want to bring a camera or a smartphone that will allow you to take close-up photos of the petals, reproductive organs, and how the leaves are attached to the stem. You will bring this information home with you and use it with other resources to finalize your identification. Before I start teaching you some tips for identifying wildflowers, I want to stress please do not pick any plants in any parks or preserves. Also, I want to be clear that wildflower identification is not usually simple and can involve many more characteristics than I am describing today. There are also wildflowers that look similar to each other, which makes it harder to accurately identify them. One feature to examine is the size of the flowers. An example of a California wildflower found at Pogus Ridge Preserve that has a large four inch flower is giant trillium. An example of a smaller flower is the gilia, which is one eighth its size. There are plants with even smaller flowers. Take a look at the flower stem structure. There are a number of wildflowers whose buds line a single stem and the buds progressively open over time. Examples include sky and chick lupines, clovers and fiddlenecks. In contrast, there are wildflowers that have one flower at the top of each stem, such as tidy tips and jewel onions. Probably the most obvious way to distinguish flowers is the color of their petals. Some examples of spring flowers that are out now are yellow California buttercups, white milkmaids, and purple vetches. There are a lot of yellow, white, blue and purple wildflowers out in parks. How do you distinguish flowers if they're all the same color? Look closely and count the number of petals and look inside to see any colors at their center. There are many different features to examine and things to note in order to make the correct identification. Other things to think about are, when did you see the flower? Winter, early spring, late spring, early summer. 
Observe the size, shape, and arrangement of the flower's leaves and how the leaves are attached to the stem. Measure how tall the plant is and how the flowers are clustered. As you can see here, the blue-eyed grass and blue witch have single flowers on each stem, but the blue dick has many flowers or clusters on each stem. Last but not least, peek inside the flower and count the number of stamens. All of this information will help you identify the wildflower using guidebooks or online resources. Some suggestions for online resources are shown here and include the California Plant Finder that is also available as an iPhone app, Wildflower Search that is also available as an iPad app, and a website called Discover Life. I also re recommend using iNaturalist for the particular park or preserve to narrow down your choices. So now that we learned a little about wildflowers, I have a question for you. Which of these choices is not a helpful way to identify a flower? So the answer is the number of pistils per flower, since there's only one in every flower. So please take a look at these two wildflowers and tell me which feature is the best way to distinguish between these two flowers based on what you can figure out from these two photos. So based on these two photos, the answer is number of petals. Another thing we will see along the trails is galls. And you can see four examples here. Galls are growths on leaves, stems, flowers, fruits and roots of plants that are made by more than 1,500 species of insect larvae. Most of them are mites, aphids, midges, and wasps. Each gall is specific to the insect that created it and vary in shape, size, and color. The insect larvae feed and spit on the plant and the plant reacts by growing cells near and around the larvae and form what is called plant tumors that surround the larvae, providing shelter until it matures and leaves the gall. Certain predatory insects insert their own larvae inside galls made by other insects. The insects compete until maturation of one or both species with the winner emerging from the gall. 
Interestingly, one type of gall has a high percentage of tannic acid and was used as ink or in dyes for wool. The Greeks used other galls for lamp fuel. Honeydew producing galls are used to attract bees and flies in the agriculture industry. And other galls have been used for food and medicine. So today we're going to be taking a 4.4 mile clockwise loop walk at Polgus Ridge Preserve. We start at the beginning of the Cordilleras Trail where it says start end. This is a flat half mile trail. Then we make a left onto the Pali Jirasi Trail that leads into shaded oak woodland and later is exposed to the sun and has coastal shrub along the trail. Polly Jirasi was a local hiker and conservationist. After she passed away, her friends and family named the trail in her honor. We will bear right onto the Hassler Trail briefly to reach the dusky footed Woodrat Trail, which takes us about 600 feet uphill for views of the Bay and Santa Cruz Mountains. When we reach the end of the dusky footed wood rat trail, we connect back to the Cordilleras trail to get back to our car. While you watch the video, look at the wildflowers we see and note the characteristics of the petals, leaves, and stamens. This video was shot, edited, and produced by Dr. Ann Ferguson for Bay Area older adults. We spot some oak leaves on the leisurely Cordilleras Trail. At first glance, interior live oak and coast live oak leaves look very similar. Both belong to the red oak subgenus, and their leaf margins typically have bristle-like teeth, although the margins may be smooth. However, an important distinguishing feature between the two is that the leaves of the interior live oak are flat, not convex like their coast live oak cousins. Another difference is that coast live oak leaves have fine tufts of hair on their underside where the lateral veins meet the central midline vein, whereas interior live oak leaves are hairless. We see a huge vine of manroot or wild cucumber to the right of the trail. It is a good example of how a particular species copes with the dry summer. As soon as it starts raining during the wet season, it grows very rapidly, like Jack's beanstalk. It spreads out, drapes itself over bushes and other plants. When it is done growing, the plant dries up to conserve its resources and no longer bothers the plants it's draped over. This is unlike ivy, which kills the plants it covers while it grows. While manroot grows, it charges its massive tuberous root, which sometimes takes the shape of a person, as shown here. A root found at the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens weighed 467 pounds. This root gets the plant through the dry season and gives it the resources to grow quickly in the next wet season. The root contains a chemical that stuns fish, and Native Americans fished by tossing pieces of pulverized roots into ponds and streams. 
The spiny green cucumber structures on the vine are the fruit. Shiny black seeds fall out of the fruit when it is ripe. This beautiful blue witch bush is part of a large and diverse family of plants called nightshades. Most of these plants are poisonous, such as the well-known ornamentals belladonna, or deadly nightshade, angel's trumpet, and tobacco plant, all of which can cause anything from skin irritation, rapid heartbeat, and hallucinations to seizures and even death. Were you aware that some of your favorite vegetables belong to the nightshade family? Examples include tomatoes, eggplant, potato and sweet potato, sweet and hot peppers, and goji berry. You may wonder, is it dangerous to eat nightshade vegetables? Cleveland Clinic states that there is no scientific evidence indicating negative health consequences of eating these vegetables. Do not eat blue witch as it is poisonous. If you look closely, you can see it's related to tomatoes. The flowers look like tomato flowers, except that they are bluish purple. They start flowering in February and last until June. Blue witch fruits look like small purple tomatoes. They typically grow in the understory of Chaparral, as well as oak woodland, where there are spots open to sun. Polygerasi Trail takes us into Oak Woodland. Polygerasi was a local hiker and conservationist. After she passed away, her friends and family named the trail in her honor. The first wildflower we see is milkmaids that are early spring bloomers and belong to the mustard family. They like to grow in moist, shady woodland areas. Like other mustards, they have four petals and four sepals, six stamens, and half-inch diameter white to pale pink flowers. The white stigma sits atop a green style in the middle of the six stamens. The ovary develops into a long, slim seed pod that holds 10 to 18 brown seeds. Milkmaids are the host plant for Sarah orange tip butterfly. Another woodland plant is the Pacific Sanicle that blooms in early spring. It flowers in small spherical clusters that can contain up to 20 flowers at the ends of long branching stems. They are from the carrot family. Their leaves are thick and textured. Native Americans made a poultice of the leaves and used it for rattlesnake bites and wounds. Its seeds are armed with sturdy prickles with hooks that are perfect for hitching a ride on animal fur or our clothes. Behind the Pacific Sanicles is a large wavy leaf soap plant. It has characteristic light green, one to two foot long, wavy edged leaves that distinguish it from other plants like the Fremont star lily. Soap plant blooms in late spring and only at night. Its flower has six white petals, each with a green mid-vein, six yellow-tipped stamens, and a style. At the end of the night, the flowers liquefy. Soap plant has many varied uses by Native Americans. Early spring leaves can be steamed and eaten like spinach, and the green juice exuded from broken leaves or sap can be used as a glue. It has a fibrous root that contains saponins, or soap, that was put in water 
to stupefy fish. If the bulb is roasted overnight, it becomes sweet and can be eaten. Last but not least, the root was used to make brushes. We spot a giant trillium on the left side of the trail. It is one of the spectacular flowers found in Pulgas Ridge Preserve. A single whorl of three leaves up to six inches long is directly attached to its stem. The leaves are dark green, often mottled with blotches of brown or purple color. This plant takes five years to flower and flowers in the winter and spring. There is one large flower per stem that can be burgundy like this one or yellow or white. It has three green sepals up to three inches long and three erect petals up to four inches long. Its ovary is attached above the sepals and petals. The burgundy stamens are concealed by the petals. We pass by a hillside that has burrows in the soil that were made by endangered Ohlone tiger beetle larvae, an insect that is endemic to California and likes to make its home in hard packed clay soil. The larvae dig their own burrow and after entering the hole backwards, hook their tail to the walls of the burrow to secure themselves in the den. Once in its burrow, it is well camouflaged because its face is flat against the surface of the soil. It patiently waits for prey to pass by to feed on. The adult beetle is a spectacular bright green with bronze tints. This open woodland wildflower that blooms in the spring goes by a variety of names including checker lily, chocolate lily, and mission bell. The leafy flowering stalk reaches up to four feet tall and carries up to 12 cup-like flowers that face down. Their six yellow petals have a unique and delicate pattern of complementary purple and brown mottling with green on the inside of the petals. You can see six stamens and three pistils in the center of the flower. In the shady, moist woodlands of the Polygerasi Trail, we find a number of ferns. Ferns are one of the oldest groups of plants on the earth, with fossil records dating back to more than 380 million years ago. This fern's scientific name comes from its five-lobed triangular fronds. If you turn over this small fern's fronds, you will see a powdery gold covering that prevents dehydration. During the dry season, its fronds curl up and the plant looks dead, but as soon as it rains or other moisture is available, they reopen and it comes back to life. Goldback fern fronds are a favorite snack of dusky-footed wood rats. Goldback ferns are in the same family as these maidenhair ferns. Maidenhair ferns have much more delicate fronds. 
These also die back during drought and rejuvenate after rain. These polyplody ferns are also called rock polyplody because they like to grow on rocks. The root of the polyplody fern is sweet and contains sugars, tannin, and oils. This is why the Spanish made a tea of the roots. Another fern along the trails is wood fern, whose leathery fronds like to reach in all directions from clusters of stalks. As you may remember, ferns do not flower or produce seeds. Instead, their reproductive organ, sporangia, produces spores that can be brown, black, yellow, or orange patches found on the underside of their leaves. On the ground, we spot two large, vivid green leaves mottled with maroon color. Looking more closely, we see exquisite deep purple and cream striped flowers between the two leaves, which each have three yellow and purple mottled sepals, three petals, and three stamen. If you dare to smell the flower, you will be overcome by the aroma of dead meat. This is where its common name, fetid adder's tongue, was derived and how it attracts one of its pollinators tiny fungus gnats. We can see the green ovary and pistil is at the center of the flower, above the petals and sepals. This wildflower is part of the lily family, loves shady forests, and blooms in January and February. When the plant flowers, the ovaries droop toward the ground and the fleshy seeds fall on the forest floor. This allows another pollinator, ants, to help spread its seeds. Ants love their tasty seed and carry them away from the parent plant, eat the fleshy part of the seed, then bury the remainder in the ground, protecting them from forest fires and hungry rodents. We notice some quarter to half inch wide and one inch tall towers protruding from the forest floor between ferns moss, and other plants. These are the homes of turret spiders, found only in moist woodlands of California. These spiders are highly susceptible to dehydration, so their young don't stray far before they build their own towers. This is why we see so many in the same location. Their turrets are lined with white silk, and the exterior is covered with moss, mud, twigs and or leaves to provide camouflage. Silk provides structural support and helps the spider incorporate debris when building the turret. The turrets can be up to six inches deep. Turret spiders are a relative of trapdoor spiders and tarantulas, and their common name came from the turrets they build. It is estimated that they have been on this earth between 80 to 100 million years. Females live about 16 years and never move out of their turret. Males live 8 to 10 years until they leave their turret to find a mate and then die. When the spider feels the vibrations of approaching prey, they figure out which direction to come out, pounce, and swing their venomous fangs down like pickaxes. Then they drag their prey into the turret. We start on the section of the dusky-footed wood rat trail that is open and full of sunshine. 
This trail is named after small, cinnamon to gray colored rodents with long whiskers, rounded ears, and furry tails. The name dusky footed refers to their dark colored feet. The trail takes us through chaparral, vegetation composed of broad leaved evergreen shrubs, bushes, and small trees that form dense thickets. We see chaparral pea, brittle leaf manzanita, toyon, chemise, sandy pygmy weed, and more. Chaparral pea has a pale green color to reflect more of the sun's light, and their leaves are small. Both features conserve water. Its flower is bright pink. Another plant that makes its home in chaparral is a low-lying spreading shrub called brittle leaf manzanita. From winter to spring, this manzanita blooms white to pale pink flowers that look like upside down bells. Brittle leaf manzanita is the host plant for the elegant sheep moth, a large orange and black moth that is easily mistaken for a butterfly when in flight. Females lay their eggs in rings on the stems of the manzanita bush. The next chaparral shrub we see on the trail is California lilac whose species includes many colorful, highly fragrant plants. Its scientific name comes from the Greek word for spiny plant because there are small spines at the edge of their leaves. With clusters of flowers that are white to blue to lilac, its fruit is a black or purple capsule that appears in summer. Looking closely at this California sagebrush, we see some white, woolly-looking growths on its stems. There are 237 species of insects associated with sagebrush, and almost 20% of the insects form galls. The predominant gall-forming insect for sagebrush is the gall midge, a family of tiny flies that lay their eggs on the stems. When the eggs hatch, the larvae secrete saliva that causes abnormal plant cell growth surrounding the larvae. This gall is caused by the sagebrush woolly stem gall midge. Lomadium daisy carpum, also called woolly fruit desert parsley, blooms from March to June. Pom-poms of tiny, greenish-yellow flowers cluster at the top of their stems. The flowers appear white because of the abundant, fuzzy white hairs covering the blossoms and stems. This desert parsley is the host plant for three kinds of swallowtail butterflies. After reaching the highest elevation of the park with panoramic views of varied plant communities the preserve supports, as well as views of the bay, we continue on the open section of the dusky footed wood rat trail to see chaparral currant, a shrub that blooms from winter to spring. It has clusters of fragrant pink flowers that attract hummingbirds, and its edible berries are eaten by birds. Some people use the leaves in peppermint tea. Sun cups are sun-loving wildflowers that are low to the ground and like to grow on the edge of trails, which means they are susceptible to foot traffic. They have four bright yellow petals and sepals, eight stamens, one yellow pistil with a knob tip, and have wide, wavy edged leaves with pointed tips. Its ovary is below the petals and sepals, often underground. Heading back into the shady forest, we see a wildflower with long stalked leaves at its base. It is called Pacific Hound's Tongue 
and its common name was inspired by the shape of its leaves. Pacific Hound's Tongue has a cluster of deep blue petaled flowers with white petal appendages at its center. This flower is a host plant for the forget-me-not caterpillar that feeds on the leaves. The caterpillar becomes a large, colorful moth with an orange neckline that contrasts its black wings and white patches. Did you know that poison oak, or western poison ivy, has fragrant flowers? These flowers provide nectar for bees, and its berries provide food for birds and mammals who do not react to the plant like we do. Native Americans boiled parts of the plant to make a juice that when left in the sun turned black and was used to dye their baskets. This warrior plume has a stout stem, burn-shaped leaves, and clusters of deep red to bright pink flowers with toothed petals. It is considered a hemiparasite because if necessary, it can use its specialized root structures to penetrate the roots of other nearby plants, such as oaks and manzanitas, to steal nutrients and water. Warrior plume can be confused with Indian paintbrush and purple owl's clover that can have similar flower structure, but warrior's plume grows in woodlands and paintbrush and owl's clover do not have fern-like leaves. So I want to thank Kathy Dollard and Mike Hunt for sharing their expertise and helping to find the plants and insects along the trails. We saw a lot of different types of wildlife on our Polgus Ridge tour. Quick question for you. Which of the items on this list did we not see on the trails? Right, so you are correct. We did not see gooseberry galls. I want to let you know that this presentation and other park tours are available at Bay Area Older Adults webpage shown here. It's our homepage, front slash videos. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. <laughs>